Next up, we have Dr. Claire Zarkessler. She is the medical director of the Pediatric Neurogastroenterology and Motility Clinic team at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children. She completed medical school at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, followed by a pediatric residency at New York Presbyterian Wheel Cornell before coming to MGH for her pediatric gastroenterology fellowship. During her fellowship, she spent time as the Fabre Gastroenterology Fellow. Pretty cool, huh? Following consulting with Fabre patients on GI symptoms and the pathophysiology and clinical manifestations of GI symptoms and Fabre disease. So her current research is, is specifically on Fabre disease and how things move through the gastrointestinal system. So we are so lucky to have Dr. Zach Kessler here today um, and able to give us a talk. So I'm going to pass it off to her. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Great. I am going to try to, I haven't done this before, so I'm going to try to share my screen um, and tell me if it works. Let's see. One moment. Okay. Can you see it okay? Exactly. Looks great. Okay, great. So today I'm going to talk about GI symptoms and Fabry disease. Uh, some of it might be a review for some of you. I spoke a few years ago and I'm updated some of the newest information that we have related to GI symptoms that have come out over the past few years too. Um, and feel free to uh, ask questions. I don't, I can't, not sure how to see the chat. So if there are questions, um, someone can hopefully let me know or we can- I can them read them out to you when it seems okay. appropriate or we can wait to the end. Either way, I'll read them for you. Great, thank you. And just disclosure, I am working on a study right now um, that we've been working on for a few years. I'll talk about it at the end um, that is examining the GI symptoms, specifically in Fabry disease. Uh, so before we really jump into things, I just have a picture here of the GI tract. Um, I think it's helpful for people to know um, kind of what the layout is and when I refer to things where they are. So just looking at the GI tract, um, we have the esophagus here and this is the stomach. Um, and then as we move down, we get to the small intestines, and then we have the colon, which I'll talk about um, frequently during the presentation. And then here we have the liver um, and the pancreas, which is also sometimes involved um, in patients with Fabry disease. So kind of know what we're uh, thinking about when we think about the GI manifestations. So a little background information. Um, there's a wide range of what the GI complaints are in Fabry disease. Uh, there have been various studies that have been published ranging anywhere from 16% to up to 70%. I think the kind of consensus is that around 50% of patients who have Fabry disease have at least some form of GI involvement. Um, the thought is, along with other areas within um, other organ systems in Fabry disease, is that Females tend to have um, initially milder disease is the thought, um, but then over time, they can have fairly significant GI uh, manifestations that equal the male presentation. Um, in terms of children, uh, there's been more emphasis placed on that, particularly related to treatment options and when to start treatment, but it's thought to be between 18 to 60% prevalence, um, similar to the adult population. Um, and a lovely study that was published um, a few years ago uh, by Don um, looked at really young children and uh, showed that really young children between the ages of one to four years old can also have uh, symptoms, uh, GI symptoms of Fabry disease. And this is important for us to know when we think about treatment options. Uh, boys tend to have an earlier onset of GI symptoms um, and they can have a more severe presentation as we know about, uh, but eventually they will have equal presentations to the women. So this is just um, a picture of a study that uh, looked at the initial uh, symptom presentation and GI symptoms are the second most common. Um, and I think that's important to note. We always think about the tingling in the hands and the feet, um, the neuropathic pain, but up to 20% of patients will present with their GI symptoms as being the initial presentation of Fabry disease. So as uh, gastroenterologists, we always have to think about it, that and then also, um, those suffering with Fabry disease or have family members who have Fabry disease, it's important to look out for the GI symptoms um, as the initial presentation. There we go. Um, and then in terms of the different types, uh, this was also a paper that looked at um, patients and the types of GI symptoms that they had. Um, sorry, let's 
Uh, the important things to note here is right here, it's around 50% of the patients that were in the survey had GI symptoms. And then the most common were abdominal pain and diarrhea, uh, followed by other types that I'll get into in a minute. So in terms of the prominent symptoms, um, the most common are um, the abdominal pain and the diarrhea, which are pretty equal in terms of prevalence that we found in Fabry disease, around 50 to 60% of patients. Uh, who complain of GI symptoms will have either abdominal pain or diarrhea or both. Um, they describe the abdominal pain uh, as being cramping frequently, can be very severe in some patients. Um, a lot will say it's kind of mid-abdominal, so somewhere right in the middle of the stomach, it's hard to localize it. And some will say it's associated frequently with food intake, not necessarily specific food, um, but just with any time that they eat, they feel that they have pain or in stressful situations. Um, and this leads us to think maybe it's related to uh, situations when there's more of a demand on the GI tract to be functioning and working well, that this can uh, lead to the pain um, presentation. The other really common presentation is diarrhea that's focused on a lot both in clinical trials and also in our treatment of these patients. Um, and they will uh, report increased urgency and frequency. Uh, I've had many patients who say that they will sometimes have to go up to the bathroom up to 10 times a day, um, sometimes won't even be able to make it to the bathroom uh, because of the urgency that they have with the diarrhea. Uh, sometimes, as with abdominal pain, it can be related just to food intake. Um, so specific foods, it can be some will say fatty foods or lactose, and others will say anytime that they eat, they immediately have to run to the bathroom. So they plan their day around when they have to eat, um, knowing when they are close to a bathroom. Um, it's a non-infectious diarrhea. And so when we think about that as gastroenterologist, we think um, that that's specifically you're not gonna see blood in the stool, you're not gonna see mucus, it won't have signs that there's an infection going on, but it's frequently kind of loose, frequent uh, diarrhea. And then some uh, patients do report constipation too, and I'll get into that a little more detail with a recent survey that came out. Um, but this has been found much more frequently in women than in men. Um, and the question with this is, is this more just a general population thing where women tend to have more constipation than men do? Um, or is this something that might be specific to Fabry disease? And over here on the right um, is just a picture of uh, the Bristol stool chart, which we use all the time as gastroenterologists. And it's important for you to know about when you're thinking about your bowel movements, um, or if you're having symptoms of Fabry disease related to the GI tract, it helps us understand where um, you fall along normal stooling patterns. And so the most normal types are between the types three to five. So anything in one and two would be more towards the constipation type and type six or seven would be more towards the diarrhea type. And so when you're talking with your doctor about your symptoms, it's important to know this. Other symptoms we don't see as commonly, but are important to note are nausea, vomiting, and early satiety. Um, and that means early fullness. Uh, we call these the upper GI symptoms because we think they affect more the stomach area than the small bowel or the colon. Um, there have been a couple published studies that um, to look at why this might be happening. One showed that patients with Fabry disease who had these symptoms also had a delay in the emptying of their stomach. Um, and so this is something called gastroparesis, which is where things aren't moving through as well um, as we would like them to. Um, and then also when they took biopsies, they found that the nerves in the stomach actually had more um, accumulation um, of the GB3. Uh, so that could be causing some of the symptoms. In terms of the body mass index, which is an indicator of weight versus height, um, and so what we look for is kind of a normal BMI somewhere right in the middle where the height is proportional to the weight. What has been published previously is that some February patients have a lower BMI, meaning that um, they have a lower weight compared to their height. But more recently, that has um, not found to be true. Um, and so it's something that we're still looking into. There have been reports of more severe and rare presentations including perforation of the GI tract, um, diverticulosis, uh, a colostomy, which is where you have to have a bag, um, death of the intestines or necrosis, pseudo obstruction, and then fistulas. And these are much more rare presentations. 
So I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about um, a survey study that was published last year um, that I think is helpful to kind of update us on what's going on with um, Fabre GI presentation. Um, so this was sent out to a bunch of different um, patient organizations. You may have filled it out yourself. Um, a questionnaire that was distributed in 2017 and 367 patients completed it, which is a good number um, and helps us understand what we know about GI symptoms. Uh, it was only for adults. Most of the participants were in the US and Canada. Um, most of them greater than uh, around 84% had more than two years since their diagnosis and greater than 70% were in ERT. Um, and so these are the results from uh, the study. And the interesting thing about this, which is um, updated from the prior studies that used um, the registry is that this broke down the symptoms, uh, the GI symptoms in more detail, rather than just focusing specifically on the abdominal pain and the diarrhea, this was able to take into account uh, many of the other presenting symptoms. So the important things that I think to note um, from the study is that it was majority female over male. Um, the thought behind that is maybe just women are more likely to complete surveys. Um, and so that could skew some of the data a little bit, uh, but we do find that women tend to have similar presentation um, of GI symptoms as men do. Um, so the diarrhea, this was at least six times a month, um, was uh, pretty prevalent, um, and that's 23% um, and 39% uh, uh, among males and females. And then um, down here, we were looking at, sorry, this was supposed to be a little bit lower, but the bloating down here, I thought was also interesting in that women reported up to 50% of them reported bloating, which is something that we don't focus on that often um, when we think about Fabry GI presentation, but I think is an important thing to note that it could be associated with some of the symptoms. And a little bit more about the survey, they also uh, looked at pain presentation. So what they didn't include in the GI um, table from before was abdominal pain because they used that in the pain aspect of the survey. Um, but they found that patients who had moderate to severe pain in general had frequent diarrhea. And that's something that we always think about as gastroenterologists is the severity of other organ system uh, presentations and the symptoms there, how does that correlate with the GI symptoms? And so this is interesting to note that patients who have um, diarrhea also tend to have um, moderate to severe pain, or at least um, a third of them do. And so that makes us think about what might be going on um, in the nerves in general that might be causing both of these types of symptom presentation. They also noted that there is a decreased pain with age, which we have uh, noted in other studies too. Uh, and the thought behind this is maybe that there's some nerve burnout um, or that the patients uh, that you might not um, be thinking about the pain as much or might have built a tolerance to the pain as you get older. The other interesting thing to um, note was that they found equal presentation of diarrhea on those on ERT and those not. Um, and so I will get into this later, but kind of the thought behind um, Fabry specific treatment versus other aspects of treatment for GI symptoms. Um, and then the other thing to note down here is that many patients have, this is what I talked about before, hands and feet pain with abdominal pain. And that's up to 60% of the respondents uh, who are on ERT and 70% who aren't um, had that combination of pain uh, in general with the abdominal pain. And then the other important thing that we always have to think about is a quality of life. And that's had a lot of focus in February, particularly with GI symptoms, because the GI symptoms don't tend to cause um, significant mortality, meaning that many patients won't um, die due to their GI symptoms, but it can cause significant morbidity uh, meaning that the quality of life and the way people can function and do what they want to do in life can be significantly hindered due to their GI symptoms. And what studies have shown is that those with significant GI symptoms in Fabry disease tend to have a lower quality of life score. Um, in the pediatric population, the boys more than girls have a lower quality of life score compared to the general population. And the thought is maybe that younger, that the children who are presenting with GI symptoms are not um, doing as well. And then anecdotally, just what we see in our office is that with GI symptoms, a lot of 
uh, kids and adults will have a significant impact on their life in terms of um, not wanting to go to school or missing school and work because of their symptoms and then feeling that they can't participate in activities because they're worried about their episodes of diarrhea or their pain or um, other aspects of the GI disease. Okay, um, let me see. Should I look at questions now before I move on? Okay, anything else? Okay, so now I want to uh, move on to what we think might be some of the um, causes of uh, the GI symptoms. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this, but um, kind of give a little background on what we think might be causing it. Um, and this is mostly suggested from some basic science research and then also from what we think happens in other organ systems. And so we think it's a combination of various um, components including a vasculopathy. So what we think is happening is that we have accumulation of the GL3 um, in the vessels that have the blood flowing through them. And this can lead to thickening of the blood vessels. Uh, and eventually over time, you uh, have decreased blood flow through those vessels, um, which can lead to things called ischemia, meaning that you have a lack of blood going to the areas in the GI tract. Another thought um, related to it is the neuropathy. Uh, similar to other uh, areas in the uh, body, we think that there's an accumulation in the nerves and this can affect how the nerves are functioning and how they're signaling and um, therefore leading to the GI symptoms. And then finally, there's the inflammatory and immunologic components that I'm not gonna get into that there's been a lot of focus on related to um, those processes that might be triggering worsening symptoms. In terms of all of these, overall, we think there's a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, um, which can affect multiple different areas, and we see this in other aspects of Fabry disease. But specifically, in GI, we think this leads to issues with dysmotility, meaning that there are problems with how things move through the GI tract. So this is a little more in depth, but I did wanna show it. This is um, a study that came out looking at a mouse model, meaning that they tried to make a mouse um, that was missing the same enzyme as we see in Fabry disease. And they uh, took biopsies from this mouse to see um, what it looked like to, to further understand what we think is going on in the human body. And what they found is that um, from the colon wall, there was a greater thickness um, of the wall. Uh, and this was related both to the vessels and to the enlarged nerves. And then they also found that there was more GB3 accumulation in the GI, uh, the colon wall. So this confirms kind of what we thought might be going on in the GI tract, that we have this accumulation of the GB3 that's leading to abnormalities, uh, both in the uh, walls of the vessels and also in the walls of the nerves. And then this is a picture um, of another study that came out recently that looked at um, biopsies from four patients with Fabry disease. They looked at two patients who um, had classic Fabry disease, and then they looked at two patients who had um, late onset Fabry disease and looked at biopsies from the stomach to see if they could find any differences between the two or if there's any um, understanding of what might be happening in these biopsies from the stomach. And so this is just a typical picture of what we see in the stomach. And you can see this brown staining on the edges. And this is where um, they put something to stain the GB3s. And so you could see the accumulation of the GB3 in the light microscopy. And then they looked in, under really high uh, microscope called electron microscopy. And this is where they were able to see the actual GB3s um, when they stain for it. And then a zebra body, which is what uh, is frequently seen in patients who have Fabry disease, um, which is this really interesting looking um, area that is indicator of Fabry. So to go back to kind of more of the clinical information, um, we think a lot about this diarrhea because it seems to be one of the most um, uh, difficult symptoms for patients who have Fabry disease. So we think about why patients might have this type of um, issue. And as I mentioned before, we think a lot of it is related to problems with the autonomic nervous system. 
So the thought is, is that in a typical uh, patient who has regular bowel movements, you get something called peristalsis, which is where things move appropriately through the colon. Um, and they start at one end, the contractions start at one end and push their way all the way towards the other end. What we think happens when this nervous system doesn't work appropriately in patients with Fabry disease is you get spastic contractions, which is you can kind of see in this picture here, you get contractions that don't flow in a pattern that pushes things through. You get contractions at random points and this can make things go back and forth or not flow through as well. Um, and they might be larger contractions than, it, um, than you would expect. And this could lead to some of the issues with the diarrhea or the dysmotility. Um, so we think it might be some discoordination of the activity in the GI tract that's leading to the diarrhea. Another thought behind it is that um, there's accumulation of the GB3 and something called the villi, which are these little fingers that project in the small bowel that help to absorb um, a lot of the nutrients that patients eat. And when you have this accumulation, we think it leads to inflammation and that the villi don't work as well. And so you get malabsorption, meaning that when you're eating, things actually aren't absorbed as well. And when they're not absorbed as well, they can kind of fly through the GI tract and lead to more issues with absorption of water, um, leading to more liquid frequent stools. Uh, there was some thought at one point about pancreatic dysfunction, meaning that the pancreas wasn't working well. Um, so a study was done that looked at um, 28 patients. Uh, some of them had GI complaints and they all found actually that they had normal fecal elastase, which means it, which is an indicator of how the pancreas is functioning. So these patients um, did not have abnormalities in the pancreas. And so our thought now is that maybe it's not as related to a pancreatic issue as may have been thought in the past. And this is just a picture from an actual person of what a, the kind of cartoon that I just showed you, where they put contrast in through, this is the rectum. Um, and then this is the colon. And you can see all this white is contrast that is outlining the colon. And what they found here was that there were these areas where there was spasming, where you can see there's no white, um, but it doesn't seem to be in appropriate fashion where it kind of flows together. It's in segmental spasms. Um, and they also saw this area that everything was thickened. Um, and so they thought possibly this could be um, contributing to the GI uh, symptoms. So this is our study that um, I had mentioned at the beginning that we're working on right now. And what we're looking at is we're trying to find patients um, with GI symptoms, trying to better understand it. And we're using something called a smart pill, which is where you uh, swallow a little capsule uh, that actually is able to measure time um, and pressures and pH. And so what we're able to do is see how things move through the whole GI tract. And so our goal is to try to correlate the symptoms, the GI symptoms that patients are having with the movement of um, everything through the gut um, to try to get a better understanding of this dysmotility that I was talking about. And we also have patients filling out questionnaires um, and doing biopsies uh, to correlate everything to get a deeper sense of what is the pathophysiology or what is underlying these GI symptoms. So this was part of a presentation uh, that we did at the uh, GI conference. This is part of the data. We haven't done complete analysis yet, uh, but we looked at 37 patients that we have studied um, with GI symptoms. Majority of them had either diarrhea or abdominal pain. Um, and all the men had diarrhea. Some of the women had diarrhea, but many had constipation too, which is an interesting thing to note. Um, as I mentioned before, is this just similar to the general population where women tend to have higher rates of diarrhea, uh, constipation, or do we think there's something specific to Fabry disease that could lead to more issues with constipation, which could be too when we think about uh, issues with dysmotility. Um, so almost 50% of the patients had abnormalities in their transit time, and most of these abnormalities were in the colon, although we did find abnormalities in the stomach and the small bowel too. And the other interesting thing to note uh, that we will um, look further into is that the women actually tended to have higher severity scores on the symptoms in the questionnaires than men. And that's important for us to think about for multiple reasons, but one of them is that the thought is frequently that men, um, because of the heterozygous nature of Fabry, that men could have more serious disease, but um, has been shown before that women can have uh, similar disease presentation. 
Um, and then it also makes us think about maybe a difference between men and women and how they interpret their disease um, or how they um, feel about their symptoms. So this is to be continued uh, when we do further analysis. And then in terms of our thoughts about the abdominal pain, as opposed to the um, diarrhea and constipation, is that this is a similar issue related to a neuropathic abnormality, um, which you just heard about recently. But we think it could be, there could be various um, aspects going on that are leading to issues with abdominal pain. So one of it is that what I talked about before, where we think there might be decreased blood flow um, in the GI tract and uh, or in the body in general, and then maybe specifically in the GI tract, particularly during those times when you need more GI, more blood flow there, such as eating um, or stressful times. Um, and so when you don't get the appropriate blood flow, you can get ischemia, uh, which means lack of blood um, and nutrients to that area. There is a recent paper published about small fiber neuropathy, which is um, related to the functioning of these nerves, um, and that may be in Fabre's disease these small fibers that affect pain are actually targeted more. And maybe the, that's why we have this overlap in the hands and feet pain and also the abdominal pain because it's all the same mechanism. Um, there's other thought that there maybe is just specific mucosal injury or inflammation that's going on in the GI tract because of Fabre and the accumulation of the GB3 that could be causing issues. In terms of the nausea and the early fullness, we think this is also related to the, nerve, the autonomic nervous system and the dysmotility that I've been talking about. So when you have the dysmotility in the colon that I just showed, there's likely a dysmotility in the stomach too. And we saw that in our study where patients um, will eat and things won't flow through the stomach as easily. Um, and this has been shown also with um, delay in gastric emptying scans. Those are the stomach uh, scans. And a newer concept that's come out over the past few years, uh, both in Fabry disease and then in the general population that there's been a lot of focus on um, is the microbial changes or the microbiome of the GI tract. And I'm sure many of you have heard about it in general because it's been a big focus um, in GI and how the microbiome and probiotics and everything are related to um, symptom presentation. And so a couple studies have been done in Fabry disease. Um, one was a study that looked at um, something called small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, which is where we think there's extra bacteria in the small bowel. And this is thought to be due maybe to issues with movement um, through the small bowel, which we know there can be abnormalities in Fabry disease. And that if things are just sitting there, that leads to more ability for the bacteria to grow greater than it is um, and leading to this overgrowth. And so they did um, a study looking at Fabre patients and controls. Uh, that's supposed to be 12 Fabre patients and 12 controls um, and found that half of the patients with Fabre disease had small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, whereas only one out of 12 of the control cells, which leads us to think maybe more about this microbiome and what's going on with the bacteria in the um, small bowel that could be contributing to the GI presentation. Um, another more recent study looked at the microbiome specifically in the colon. Uh, and the thought behind this is that the GB3 can actually uh, change the gut bacteria um, and it, it leads it more towards the growth of specific bacteria. And so if we have patients who have a higher accumulation of GB3, maybe their gut bacteria is different than someone who doesn't have this um, accumulation. And so that was looking specifically just at the different gut bacteria um, in the colon. So another two kind of areas that need to be looked into a little bit more, but really helpful in helping us try to understand what we think might be going on. And this was a nice um, drawing that kind of combined everything together. Um, that was published by Hiltz a couple of years ago, but a combination of things of what we think might be going on. So part of it is that accumulation in the villi we think might be related to malabsorption. Um, and then we also have the changes in the microbiome. So the difference between the helpful bacteria and the harmful bacteria might be um, skewed in patients with Fabry disease due to their underlying accumulation of GB3. Um, are there other factors, neurological, um, psychosomatic, other environmental factors that are playing in. And then this is the um, neuropathic issues that we've been talking about with the autonomic nervous system, the accumulation of GB3 um, that we think might be contributing to a lot of the symptoms. So it's not one specific area that we think 
is the sole uh, problem that we sometimes see in other organ systems. We think it's a combination of multiple different factors, which therefore makes it much more difficult to treat. But um, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, okay, let me just show this. So in terms of um, a differential diagnosis, it's important for us to think about uh, what else could this be other than uh, Fabry disease? And that, as gastroenterologists, we feel that that's an important um, aspect to educate other gastroenterologists about, because I'm sure many of you have found that maybe your local gastroenterologists don't know Fabry disease or don't have much experience with it. And so it's not always the initial thought when someone presents with GI symptoms. And as someone who works with Fabry patients, we're trying to educate um, gastroenterologists further, particularly because as I showed before, many um, younger kids or patients will present with GI symptoms not knowing that that's their presentation of Fabry disease. So it's something that we want it to be on the radar of physicians to think about when someone's presenting with GI symptoms. The issue is that um, they're nonspecific symptoms, and so there's not, a, there's not a great way to know if your symptoms are specifically related to Fabry disease or not. The most common overlap we see is with something called irritable bowel syndrome diarrhea type. And these are patients who um, don't have Fabry disease, uh, but are thought to have similar symptoms. And that includes abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, bloating. Um, and so it's hard to differentiate the two. And a lot of times patients with Fabry disease will get the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome prior to their actual diagnosis of Fabry disease. Um, the other areas to think about, are inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, celiac disease. Um, reflux can frequently overlap in Fabry disease, so it's not necessarily means that you don't have Fabry um, if you have reflux. Um, and then there are other systemic diseases that can mimic uh, the presentation of Fabry disease. The issue is that since it's nonspecific, there is frequently a delay in diagnosis of patients with Fabry disease. Um, if it's just a GI presentation because they'll frequently be given other diagnoses before they're given the actual diagnosis of Fabry. And so this is um, just a study that was done looking at patients to see how they overlap with the functional diseases. Functional GI diseases are things like irritable bowel syndrome um, or other comp GI uh, problems that um, don't necessarily fit into a specific category. And so that's where there's a lot of confusion because um, Fabry patients present very similarly to patients who have these functional diseases like irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and so it makes it tricky to um, pick them out. And so what they did is they looked at 50 Fabry patients, 35 of them had GI symptoms and had them fill out the questionnaires for functional disorders and found that there was actually a lot of overlap which as I've been talking about is not surprising because we know that the symptoms are very similar. And so it makes it very difficult for us as providers to uh, know when to test for Fabry disease and when to say, okay, this is more of an irritable bowel syndrome. And so it's important if there is any family history or anything like that, that your provider knows about that. So on to more of the um, understanding of the treatment and the workup. Um, it's very important to be seen by a gastroenterologist if you're having GI symptoms. So when you do go to see the doctor, um, they'll ask you about your GI symptoms and it's important to give as many details if you, as you can. Um, when do they occur? Are they, as I talked about before, are they related to food intake? Are they related to specific activities like exercise? Um, how often? Um, how is it related to food? Um, and then other symptoms that might help rule out its relationship to Febre. So if there's blood in the stool, that's unlikely to be caused by Febre. Is there weight loss or other symptoms? Um, it's helpful for them to know about other workup that's been done and other medications that have been tried. Um, and even if your doctor isn't that familiar with Febre disease, it's still helpful um, to get their input based on kind of what you have uh, done before. So the last little bit I want to spend talking about um, treatment in Fabry disease. So there's a lot of emphasis on treatment specifically for Fabry disease. So there's, uh, there have been multiple um, studies published on ERT and the effects on, Fabry, on GI symptoms. 
Um, there are many patients who will have improvement in their symptoms. Um, up to 30% will have improvement in their abdominal pain or their diarrhea, mostly based on the registry uh, information. But uh, in these studies, it's still noted that up to, up to um, two thirds of the patients can still have GI symptoms. And even with Megalostat, they published, a study was published recently um, looking at improvement in diarrhea, which was great with the treatment, but many of the patients continue to have symptoms of diarrhea. So they may have had improvement, but the symptoms didn't resolve. Uh, so that leads us to think, one, about what, under, what is going on that's um, underlying the symptoms, but also what can we do to help treat these symptoms better that might not be Fabry disease specific. Um, and one thing to note from the survey that I had talked about earlier from 2019 is that um, many of the patients, when they looked at pain specifically, continue to have pain um, despite uh, extended treatment with ERT. So that makes us think from a GI perspective, how can we um, treat patients better for their GI symptoms? Because as I mentioned, quality of life significantly deteriorates with GI symptoms and it can really affect many patients' lives. And so as gastroenterologists, we have to think about what other options we have available to further evaluate and then also further treat um, patients for their GI symptoms that might not be specific to Febre um, treatment in general. So a couple of newer studies that are guiding us towards um, other options um, from the nutritional aspect, which is always an, um, an area that people are interested in. So this study came out recently that looked at a specific um, supplementation with Agal. Um, and the thought is behind this is that um, supplementing with Agal, which many patients don't have high amounts of, um, can decrease the gas production and change this microbiome that we have been talking about. Uh, so they took seven patients and they put them on commercially available uh, dietary supplements of it. And these uh, patients all filled out uh, GI questionnaires once a month. And the really interesting thing to note here, although it was a small population, only seven patients, they showed significant improvement um, over time. And so over 12 weeks, um, the abdominal pain essentially resolved in all the patients, um, except for one who continued to have mild pain. And then the diarrhea improved uh, slightly from 2.6 days per week to half a day per week of having diarrhea. So it wasn't um, uh, resolved completely, but these are significant um, areas to note the improvement um, by taking an oral supplement. Um, and they also noted that none of the patients got worse um, after taking it. Uh, they all reported a general improvement in their GI symptoms and overall well being. They also looked specifically at the blood and found that this um, supplementation increased the enzyme availability. So that might improve, that might have been through the gut. And so the thought is maybe we can take oral supplements as opposed to necessarily needing um, other types of treatment. Once again, this is a very preliminary. Um, uh, test um, or study, but I think it's an important thing to note. There's a lot more that needs to be done in this area. So this is not a recommendation to do anything at this point, um, but this is an interesting study that will lead us to look further into maybe um, oral supplementation via the gut um, and maybe uptake from the gut. So, Dr. Zarkessler, there was yeah. actually one of the questions that was already about this question. So yeah. when we're talking about this uh, supplement, would that be Beano or is there a different kind of more generic alpha galactosides you would take? It's a good question. I don't know enough about it and I don't honestly feel comfortable um, recommending it at this point because it's such a small study. Um, and even the paper itself says that it's not a recommendation. It's just more what we would call like a, a baseline study so that we can do further testing in a greater population to know if this is something that should be added. Um, and so I wouldn't, there's nothing specific from my perspective that I'm going to say to try at this point based on the mm -hmm. study. But I think from a GI perspective, it's exciting because it means that there's a possibility in the future with more studies that we can do more with it. Sounds good. Thanks. Um, and then the other, um, there was a nutrition uh, paper that was published this year, just um, discussing the nutritional aspects in Fabry disease, which is always a question uh, that I have from patients. So just a background in terms of blood work and labs, most Fabry patients have normal blood work. And so that's not um, in terms of electrolytes um, and nutritional um, values. And so that's not something that we routinely will be checking because typically it will not be abnormal. 
Um, we do recommend targeted removal of food triggers. So if you are someone who finds that um, fatty foods could trigger things um, or lactose, there's certainly tests we can do for that. Um, and sometimes I'll just have patients take that out of their diet if they feel like that's a major trigger. Um, the FODMAP diet, I'm not sure um, if many of you have heard of, but uh, this is a popular diet that came out now probably 10 years ago. Um, that is uh, decreasing the amount of um, short chain fermentable carbohydrates in the diet. The thought behind this is that these can lead to increased water volume and gas production in the GI tract, which can worsen GI symptoms. And so if we can decrease these, then maybe um, this can lead to improvement um, in overall GI symptoms. It's used frequently in irritable bowel syndrome. And if we think that there's an issue with uh, GB3 accumulation, maybe this is also related to um, the excess uh, carbohydrates. And so um, the thought is if patients do well with it with irritable bowel syndrome, maybe um, February patients can do well too. It's a pretty um, uh, tricky diet in the sense that there are many things to be taken out. And so we always recommend if it's something that you're interested in doing to meet with a nutritionist to review it. As studies have shown that those who are the most successful with the diet are those who do it in a very specific manner and are followed by a nutritionist. Um, but we have many patients who do improve in general with irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, we haven't tried as much in Febre, but the thought is it could possibly help with Febre patients, uh, particularly with the abdominal pain and diarrhea. And then uh, they also recommended an anti-inflammatory, anti-oxidative um, stress diets, um, which also you can meet with nutritionists about those are specific diets that are thought to target less inflammatory um, ingest ingestion of less pro-inflammatory pro um, foods. And so um, this thought behind it is that if there is some inflammatory immunologic process going on in the GI tract that is contributing to the symptoms by decreasing some of these food intakes, it could help. Neither of these have specifically been studied in February patients, but um, is taken from other disease processes that we think could help uh, in February disease. And then this, I just want to briefly uh, go through. I talked about this um, a few years ago, and we published this, but uh, just so people can have a little understanding of how we think about things as gastroenterologists um, and things for you to go back to your gastroenterologist uh, and talk about if you think that this might be related to some of your symptoms. So when we think about the abdominal pain, we break it down into different areas that we think might be causing it. So the neuropathic is what I talked about. We think that those nerves aren't functioning as well. Um, we can do a colonoscopy, look at it under a biopsy, um, and then treat uh, with neuromodulation, which um, is similar to medications that we use in the for pain. So neuromodulators are medications that we think target these small fibers of these nerves that are um, triggering the pain. So things like gabapentin or amitriptyline are, are frequently used, particularly amitriptyline because it can slow down the gut too. And so we, I do use it in my Febre patients who have both diarrhea and abdominal pain. Uh, so it can hopefully target both. Uh, if we think it's an issue with blood flow, we can look to see how <laughs> blood is flowing through the GI tract um, and treat that with things that we can possibly the vessels uh, to allow for more blood flow. Um, and then acid reflux, I mentioned briefly, you can do studies to look at the amount of acid reflux. I do have patients who have acid reflux, who have Febrile disease, who have improvement of their abdominal pain with treatment, but not necessarily resolution. So I wouldn't say acid reflux is typically the sole cause of pain, but it's something that, um, particularly with patients with dysmotility, that could be one of the factors. And so we think about treating that with proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. And then the diarrhea, um, these are just the areas that I talked about that we think might be related to some of the uh, symptoms of diarrhea. So pancreatic insufficiency, you can get that test that I talked about, the stool last case, and you can get supplements for the pancreas if it's not functioning as well. As I showed in that study though, that doesn't seem to be usually the cause of the diarrhea. And so I wouldn't say that's typically where we go when we initially look uh, into treatment, but it is something to think about with your GI doctor. Um, Bacterial overgrowth is what I mentioned before, that small intestines where the bacteria gets uh, overgrown or too much of it. So there are tests specific for that that you can look for are called the lactulose breath test. And then we actually have specific um, medications that we use for that. Um, it's usually an antibiotic that's not absorbed into the uh, 
bloodstream, but works specifically in the GI tract to um, kill some of that bacteria. And frequently we also use probiotics at the same time. Uh, the dysmotility that I talked about, the transit time with how things are moving through the GI tract that we're actually studying. You can use um, the wireless capsule that I mentioned or the other tests that are sometimes done. And then we have medications that we call, call uh, promotility agents that will either help things move through or uh, other motility agents, agents that will slow things down. Um, and then there's that question of malabsorption where the villi are uh, picking things up as well. And so you can look in the stool to see if things are not being absorbed um, since stool studies. And based on that, you can decide if there are other changes that need to be made if there is an issue with malabsorption. And then uh, finally, the upper GI tract or the gastric that we talked about with the nausea, the early fullness. Um, we think this is frequently related to slow movement of the stomach itself. And so there are tests that can be done that I mentioned briefly, the gastric emptying scan, or the wireless capsule that will look to see how fast are things moving through the stomach. And if they're not moving through that well, then we can always give medications that will help move through specifically in the stomach, not necessarily targeting other areas of the GI tract. So in summary, I know that was a lot of information, but um, we know that the GI symptoms can be severe and they lead to a significant decrease in quality of life. And so that's where our focus is at this point is trying to figure out how we can make um, the GI symptoms better so that quality of life can improve. We don't know exactly much about the mechanism, but we do have many hypotheses and we're actually getting more and more information um, every year about what we think is specifically going on. And this is helping us uh, target specifically how we can treat these GI symptoms, mm -hmm. not always with general uh, febrile treatment, um, which can help, but uh, also specific GI um, medications that can help specifically the GI tract. Um, and so we really have to think about how we can better serve our patients uh, with Fabry disease. And on your part, it's really important for you to talk to your doctor about your GI symptoms. I have many patients who have ignored them for many years, um, particularly if there are other family members who have the same symptoms and you don't feel like there's much you can do, but there's actually a lot that can be done. Um, it's just important to really speak, to find the right doctor and speak about what the symptoms are. And before I finish, I do want to just say briefly about our study that um, we're still recruiting uh, a few more patients for. Um, and this is looking um, for patients with Fabry disease who have GI symptoms and have also not been treated for their Fabry disease ever or less than six months. Um, and what the study is doing is we're using the smart pill to look at the movement of um, things through the gut in addition to questionnaires. And then we also look at a biopsy um, from the end of the colon to try to correlate everything together. So the goal of our study is really to get a broad understanding of these GI symptoms, um, both from um, a clinical perspective in terms of what the actual symptoms are, and then what we think might be underlying them uh, to better help us uh, treat um, our fed -bay patients and know um, how to make them feel better. So that was um, uh, a lot of information, but hopefully it was helpful. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to answer if there are any questions or anything that uh, anyone wants to know about. So there's a lot of really good questions. Do you want okay. me to uh, kind of? Sure. Um, All right. I'm happy to do that. So okay. no oh, here, I can look too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, if you want to look and just answer them, that works just okay. fine. So I'll just start with the first one I see is, um, my teenager spends a long time in the bathroom, um, either with bowel movements or wiping, tending to her constipation. Is there anything that we can do? So that is, I would certainly say there's something you can do, and I certainly think you should see a doctor, a uh, gastroenterologist. I see many patients like that, both with Fabry disease and those without. Um, and so I think it's important for there to be more evaluation um, to further understand, is this an issue with constipation? Because it certainly could be, and there are many medications for constipation. We also know that sometimes in patients, um, not necessarily with Febre, they have issues with actually defecation and getting stool out. And so that might be a component. Um, and so I think there are many avenues, and I haven't talked about evaluation in general for um, workup of these symptoms, but there's many things that can be done, and I see many patients like that. So I think seeing um, a doctor who specializes in that could be really helpful um, uh, to, get a, to get a better treatment plan. Um, okay, could you please talk a little bit about the impact of chronic diarrhea and electrolyte balance? A nephrologist asks us to watch potassium closely. What does the diarrhea to potassium levels? 
So that is a good question. So actually the diarrhea itself, the reason that we're looking at potassium specifically is because of the kidney functioning in addition to the diarrhea. It depends on how excessive the diarrhea is. The concern with um, excessive diarrhea is that it can lead to um, abnormalities of the pH balance, and that's where we get most concerned about um, it. Most patients that I have seen with Fabry disease do not have abnormalities of that. It gets trickier when the kidney function is not, um, uh, the kidney isn't functioning as well, because then you don't have the balancing effect of the kidney that can counteract the um, output from the GI tract. So in those patients who need to be followed specifically, uh, patients who have poor renal function should be followed very closely if they have really significant diarrhea. But these are patients who I would say have liquid diarrhea 10 times a day. If you're having a few loose stools a few times a week, that shouldn't affect the balance. And so I think that's an important thing to note. Um, oh, good. Someone said they've had minimal diarrhea problems since starting ERT, which is great. Um, yeah, so hopefully I answered some of the questions about the diet. Um, someone was asking about that. And unfortunately, we don't have great um, randomized control trials, which is what we would love to have to kind of recommend anything. So there are really no specific trials with diets, but I think some of these based on our understanding of why we think uh, the GI symptoms are happening, some of the diets I talked about, I think certainly could be useful. Um, yeah, and so I... Someone asked about the study, which hopefully um, you got some information about. I also will be sending out more information um, uh, to everyone again about it. I think we've sent something in the past, but we can uh, send out more with the contact information. Um, and we are still um, doing the study um, with COVID and we do support travel um, if you're coming from another place in the country. Um, yep, so again, so question again about malabsorption. Um, and vitamin deficiency. So we've actually found that there don't tend to be significant vitamin deficiencies. I showed you that list before of um, B12 and vitamin D, and most of those tend to be normal in patients. So we don't think there's an issue with that absorption. That typically happens more at the end of the um, small bowel, and that doesn't tend to be an issue for Fabry patients. We think more about malabsorption in uh, the upper small bowel. Um, and so areas like that, and we have not found there to be significant issues with vitamin deficiencies. Um, but I always recommend to my patients to take um, a multivitamin to make sure that we kind of have a good balance there. Um, I can certainly answer more about malabsorption if there are further questions. Um, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing with the malabsorption. Um, we don't have wonderful data on it. The, we think a lot of the diarrhea is actually caused more by um, this dysmotility. And so a lot of the absorption that happens has already happened by the time you have the issue with the diarrhea. What we think the colon itself actually is where a majority of water is resorbed, um, or it gets the stool from the liquid state to the, um, the solid state. And so if things are moving really fast through the colon, then you're not gonna get that absorption of water. And that's where we think a lot of the issues with the liquid diarrhea are happening. Um, and so it's not necessarily severe malabsorption. And we haven't found that to be the case in many of our patients. We find that many things are actually absorbed okay further up in the GI tract, and that it's more of an issue with absorption of the water in the colon. Um, this is a good question. Let's see, how can, yeah. So two similar questions about um, friendly microbiome and probiotics. And so I always get questions about probiotics and the microbiome. It's a very hot topic these days in general. Um, again, as you know, Fabry has not been studied um, dramatically. And in general, we really have not focused at all on probiotics. I tell patients who have questions about probiotics, I support probiotics. I think they can be helpful. I don't, I don't think we have great data at this point to say that everyone should be on a probiotic in general for specific symptoms. Um, Probiotics themselves are a huge kind of um, conglomeration of many different bacteria. And so what I sometimes say is we're kind of throwing the kitchen sink of different bacteria at you and hoping that some of them will work. Um, and I think that's because science, typically we just don't know which are the appropriate bacteria to specifically take in which situation. And we have found that there are people who do better with probiotics. And so what I always tell my patients is, if you're otherwise healthy, 
your immune system's working well, I don't have a problem with trying probiotics. That being said, if we try probiotics for a few months and it doesn't seem to change any symptoms, it's not that if you stay in it for another year, it's going to make things better. And it can be expensive. And so I do recommend trying one or two different types because they all have different bacteria in them. Um, but that after some time, if you're not noticing a difference, it's not necessary to continue on it. Um, okay. Yeah, so Beano is something that I have not used specifically in Fabre patients. Um, but again, it is something that I have patients who have tried and feel that it does help them, particularly with gas um, and kind of bloating. And so that's certainly something that can be tried. Um, yeah, so celiac disease has definitely been reported in patients with Fabry disease. Unclear at this point, I would argue it's probably happens to just overlap and not necessarily caused by Fabry disease. But again, as I mentioned, the nutritional part is we really need to think about um, how uh, other aspects of kind of dietary um, interventions that might be able to help people. And so that's why I always think it's important to meet with a gastroenterologist to see if there are other factors that might be contributing to your symptoms. Um, okay, and the email address, oh yeah, I should put this back up. This is the study. Um, and so this is our research coordinator. Um, I don't know that I, I'm sorry, I just saw the last one. I don't know this PRX 102. I haven't, um, I'll have to look into that. Um, but yeah, so for the study, if anyone is interested, please feel free to reach out. We'll send out more information. Um, I'll reach out to Don and uh, Jerry about um, getting more information if anyone is interested. We're, we have a few more people we're trying to recruit and then hopefully get some information so we can pass it out. Okay, um, any other questions or anything I can answer? Great. That was great, thank you so much. This is yeah, I hope that was helpful. Um, and I'm happy yeah, very to reach out to me too if you have specific other questions, I'm happy to sure. answer.